Greetings. I'm Don Messer, a retired United Methodist pastor and executive director of the Center for Health and Hope and co-chair of the United Methodist Association of Retired Clergy and Friends, we call UMARC. In 1968, when the United Methodist Church was created with the merger of the Evangelical United Brethren and the Methodist Church, our great excitement and hope was that our denomination was moving toward inclusiveness. As a young person, I had been appalled when I discovered how racially segregated our denomination was and how racism was embedded into the life of the faith community. In 1964, as a young seminarian from Boston University, I protested at the Pittsburgh General Conference about the segregated Central Conference that persisted across America. So in 1968, I welcomed a new church with a new constitution that I included at the very beginning of part one, division one, an article entitled Inclusiveness of the Church. But in the intervening 56 years, United Methodism failed to live up to the promise of overcoming racism and further champion blatant homophobia and transphobia. Two weeks from today, United Methodism has a chance for a new beginning. The crucifixion we've experienced these past years with church disaffiliations and distorted theological attacks can lead us to the resurrection of an inclusive church, the proclamation that indeed God's inclusive love in Jesus Christ is indeed for all people. Tonight, on behalf of Umark, my colleague and co-chair, Reverend Dr. Harvey Martz, welcome you to this two-hour webinar. Thank you, Don. It's so good to be with um, a record number of people, some uh, 1,600 participants tonight in this um, webinar on resurrection of the inclusive church. I, I will need the slide, Jim, that has the two paragraphs on each side to tell about the history of you, Mark. In, in 2016, we were founded to give unwavering support of our newly elected bishop, Karen P. Olavido. We based our uh, establishment on the words of the prophet Isaiah speaking for God, who said, my house shall be a house for all people. And on the words of St. Paul in Galatians, in Christ, God has broken down the divide, dividers, the artificial barriers we create that we use to make us feel more righteous than other people, that God has broken those barriers and dividers. With a call to the church to stop the harassment and abuse of our new spiritual leader, we were formed in a commitment to stand in solidarity with LGBTQ plus laity, clergy, and candidates for ministry. You mark dreams and works for an inclusive United Methodism reflecting reflective of the inclusive love of God in Jesus Christ. So before we begin uh, the webinar, I want to uh, let you know that this uh, free webinar is uh, provided to you through UMARC. Uh, we do need some contributions. Uh, and as the slide was showing you, a moment ago, we have about uh, $900 extra cost for Zoom because we have such a great crowd tonight. Uh, so our cost is a little over $2,000. So we really uh, blatantly invite you to make a contribution at this website or send a check to Umark uh, at 7185 South Niagara Circle Centennial. Uh, we are a nonprofit and we simply uh, want to make this available to all of you. The format tonight is for me to uh, begin the introductions with the first three speakers, and my colleague Harvey will introduce the next three speakers. After that, Harvey and I will fade uh, into the background, and one speaker after another will speak to you. You have an opportunity to uh, ask questions through the chat line, uh, you, uh, and we have uh, people standing by to seek to answer any questions and uh, if possible, feed them on to uh, the speakers or, or future speakers to answer. So uh, use your chat line at that point to uh, communicate. 
and we will just move from speaker to speaker. Our opening speaker is Reverend ha Adam Hamilton, the senior pastor of the 22,000 member Church of the Resurrection in Leewood, Kansas, the largest congregation in United Methodism. Uh, as you know, he's a popular preacher and best-selling author. His newest book is entitled Wrestling with Doubt, Finding Faith. Next, we have Karen, Bishop Karen Olavito, uh, our beloved Episcopal leader of the Mountain Sky Conference. Her autobiographical book, Together at the Table, chronicles her experiences as the first openly LGBTQ plus bishop in the United Methodist Church. Dr. Randall Miller will then speak, a leading United Methodist layman, longtime advocate for LGBTQ plus inclusion, former professor of United Methodist Studies, Ethics, and Leadership. He's currently the Chief of Staff and Chief of Operation at Borellis you know, Philanthropy, a progressive social justice funder. Following Dr. Miller, the Reverend Dr. Lydia Munoz is United Methodist Pastor and General Conference Clergy Delegate from the Eastern Pennsylvania Conference. She currently serves as the Executive Director of the National Plan for Hispanic and Latino Ministry. Reverend Dr. Israel Alvarado, a United Methodist Pastor from the Philippines Annual Conference, currently serves as an organizer for the Reconciling Ministries Network in the Western and North Central jurisdictions. Our last speaker will be a longtime friend of our UMARC group and frequent uh, resource person on our webinars. Reverend Dr. Mark Holland is the co-founder and executive director of Mainstream UMC based in Prairie Village, Kansas. He is a third generation United Methodist pastor. He served as the mayor of Kansas City, Missouri, and will be a delegate to the upcoming General Conference. Adam Hamilton, my friend of 25 years, will lead us off. Uh, Don and Harvey, thank you so much for, for pulling this together, and thanks for the 1,600 people who are joining us. This is an exciting time in United Methodism, I believe. I'm very excited about the uh, General Conference coming up. It will be my eighth General Conference, and uh, the first two as an alternate uh, delegate. And uh, during that period of time, I've watched as we spent most of our time, and it seemed like uh, most of the oxygen in the air at General Conference focused on, um, on fighting and on conflict around human sexuality. And so I'm looking forward to, with hope, what's going to be happening at this General Conference. You'll hear a lot more about that from the other speakers today. I want to talk just a little bit about the future of the United Methodist Church post-General Conference and, uh, and share with you a little bit about uh, some of the research we've done uh, uh, related to where the church is today. So uh, I'd like to begin with that. So we've seen uh, over the last 23 years, religious affiliation in America drop dramatically, way more than we've seen in, in times past. As late as the year 2000, 70% of Americans, as most of you likely know, uh, were a part of a faith community. In 2023, that number dropped to 45%. So to remain stable for the previous 40 or almost 50 years and decline by, from 70% uh, to 45% between 2000 and 2023, single largest drop on record, that's at least 40 million people who used to belong to a faith community who no longer do. 40 million. I want you to think about that for a moment. And uh, just during Holy Week, PRRI, Public Religion uh, Research Institute, released their findings from uh, a series of studies they did in 2023. And they interviewed, surveyed 5,627 people who were not actively involved in churches, but had been in the past, or faith communities, synagogues, mosques, uh, temples. And they wanted to know, why did people drop out? I just want to mention these top five responses that they had, um, because these are things we're talking about at Resurrection right now. I think they're things we should be thinking about as a denomination. 67% who of these who dropped out stopped believing what their religion taught. And uh, so these were people who had questions, they were, they were wrestling with uh, doubts, and they found that the answers they were getting in their churches no longer were, were rationally satisfying to them, and they dropped out because of what their faith was teaching them. The second, uh, an the second top answer was 47% cited the church's negative teaching about LGBTQ people. So we're going to be addressing that tonight and at General Conference, I hope. 32% said church was bad for their mental health, and I want you to think about that for a moment what it would be like to go to a church and leave because you felt like church was bad for your mental health. 
31% said the cited the sexual abuse scandals among clergy. A large number of those were former Catholics, but some Protestants as well. And 30% uh, noted the church's polarizing politics. And so when we look at the people who've dropped out, at least those that were surveyed, this is what we find. So I want to suggest that if we're looking at the future of the United Methodist Church, we're going to move towards being a more inclusive church. I believe that's going to happen at General Conference. Uh, I have great hopes for what will happen at General Conference, though I've been deeply disappointed in the past. I think things have fundamentally changed. And if we if everything doesn't change this time around, I know it's coming soon. And I feel very confident about that. Um, but given that, we're going to change the Book of Discipline. The question is, what will that do for the future of our of our denomination? And one thing it does is it removes the roadblock that we have uh, currently for the 47% who said the reason why they left church was because of the church's negative uh, teaching about LGBTQ persons. And so that's good. We're going to remove a roadblock, but removing roadblock won't be enough. And so I want to suggest that part of the uh, hope I have for the church is us remembering who we are, particularly as United Methodists, because I believe that the United Methodist approach to the gospel that led me to move from being a Pentecostal, charismatic uh, member of an Assembly of God church when I was graduating from high school, going to Oral Roberts University and finding myself struggling there and having my own deconstruction and becoming an ex-evangelical before that was a term in, uh, in, in 1982, and that led me to join the United Methodist Church is still what's what appealed to me about United Methodism then is still something that will appeal to a great number of those 40 million if we do church well enough and we remember who we are. So I want to suggest a few things uh, to you today along those lines. And, uh, and then I want to give just a couple of closing suggestions. So for the 67% who stopped believing what their religion taught, not all of those were fundamentalists. There were a lot of people who were on the right or more fundamentalists who, who found that, uh, but not all of them were there. But they were doing deconstruction, right? And many of those, especially those who were on the, on the uh, far right, uh, conservative evangelicals, um, some of those who left became known as ex-evangelicals, right? So they struggled. And, and I think what they struggled with is sometimes they were told that it wasn't okay to doubt. I remember when I was beginning to struggle with doubt, I found myself going to my pastor, a little Assembly of God church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and him saying, you just shouldn't ask so many questions. Don't ask so many questions. And I'm like, that doesn't seem right. And by the time I got halfway through my freshman year in college at Oral Roberts University studying to be a charismatic Pentecostal pastor, all these questions came to a head for me when two of my best friends were killed in an accident. And all of a sudden, the answers I was getting made no sense. And that's when I found myself thinking, I'm not sure if I can still be a Christian or believe in God. And I began searching for where are there better answers? Nothing against the Assemblies of God or the Pentecostal churches. Not everybody would have given the answers I got from that particular Pentecostal church. But I found myself drawn to Wesley and to Methodist theologians. And some of you know, I checked out from the library at Oral Roberts University, the Book of Discipline, the most authoritative book I can find on Methodism. And I read the historical statement, and then I read the theological task and our doctrinal uh, standards. And I thought, this is what I've been looking for. And what I found was a church where you weren't, supposed to, you, you weren't supposed to check your brain at the door of the church. You weren't asked to do it. You weren't supposed to do it. You were meant to engage your intellect in your faith. I found a church that, that was a renewal and revival movement leading the 18th century evangelical revival, but it started at Oxford University. And those early Methodists were, were students who believed in bringing together knowledge and vital piety. Or in my sermon last Sunday, I talked about erudidio et religio, the, the uh, motto from uh, Duke University. But it comes right from a Charles Wesley hymn, right? The, the prayer that we would unite the, so long, so long, unite the two so long disjoined, knowledge and vital piety. That appealed to me. And a place where you could ask questions and where there was it was okay to doubt and wrestle with things. And that's where we are today. So many of these folks, if they're going to find a church, it's going to be a church. If they're going to find a church compelling, it'll be a church that says it's okay for you to wrestle with doubt. Bring your brain to church. You're meant to love God with your mind. And this last weekend, I was preaching on Deuteronomy, or excuse me, on Matthew 22, 36 through 37, which comes from Deuteronomy 6, where Jesus says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your being and with all your mind. And the word mind there, for those of you who know the Greek, dianoia, uh, is actually an interesting word. Noia sig uh, signifies the brain or the intellect, but dia is through. And so dianoia means that you think things through, you reason or many Greek dictionaries uh, translate that word as critical thinking. And, uh, and I love the fact that Jesus is calling us to, to love God with our critical thinking skills. We're that kind of church that encourages that. You may remember, um, I'm sure many of you do, the uh, novella that came out in the last century uh, called The River Runs Through It, eventually made into a film. And uh, the Presbyterian pastor who was a little uh, you know, looking down on Methodists, but he described us as Baptists who could read. 
this idea of, of uh, you know, the Baptists were longing to bring people to Jesus, and they had this passionate faith, but they didn't always have much of an education, whereas the Methodists had this passionate faith and this longing to bring people to Jesus, and they, they had an intellect to go with it. And that's, I don't mean to berate Baptists, because today that's not necessarily true of Baptists, but it certainly is what drew me to the United Methodist Church, and this idea that we're called to be critical thinkers, that we're called to engage our intellect. And I find that's what draws, so at resurrection of those 22,000 members, two-thirds of them were non-religious or nominally religious before they started coming to the church. And over and over again, I hear them say, I love being at a church where I'm encouraged to think, where I'm encouraged to ask questions, where it's okay to do that. Uh, I want to mention just briefly, the 47% who cited the church's negative teaching about LGBTQ persons. So I'm hoping that at General Conference, we will uh, clearly address this, that we will remove from the Book of Discipline language that should have never been added to the Book of Discipline. So our Books of Discipline up through 1971, so the 1968 Book of Discipline, didn't say anything about this. And uh, and as we add this, we added something at a time, so what, you know, the, the hurtful language, and also some positive language. And we did this at a time where, of course, we're in great conflict in, a ch in the church. And what I find at Resurrection is we don't ever bring something to a vote where we have, we're going to win by 55% or 60%. Like, that's just bad for the church. That's bad for our church when we do that. But as a denomination, we've been doing this now for 52 years. We come to General Conference, and we are divided in this way. And my hope is that whatever we end up doing next is something that we can all stack hands on and say, okay, I can live with that. And uh, and it's something that removes, again, clearly removes the harmful language and policies that we have in our Book of Discipline. So I think that's going to be pivotal, pivotal for that 47%. Again, it doesn't necessarily get them in our church, but it takes away the roadblock that currently keeps people away. And, and to be a church, so in Kansas City, um, United Methodist Churches and some of the other mainline churches are the churches that are saying we're a church for everybody. And, uh, and there's a whole lot of other churches, many of the large churches, who have not been willing to say that. And what I find everywhere I go is people come up to me and they say, thank you for what your church stands for and who you are. We're so grateful for that. My son is gay. My my, you know, I'm gay. Wh whatever. But we have people who recognize our church for making a stand there, and I think that's going to be a positive for many United Methodist churches who can make those same statements. But I also believe the importance of our being a church where we are including people who are traditionalists. So we've got forty percent of our people, maybe more, who are traditionalists in the United Methodist Church, and what we want is for that forty percent not to be setting the policies for everybody else. But I know that if you had told me um, 25 years ago that I would have to have my current view on human sexuality, then I probably would have left the church. Instead, there were people who, were, who embraced me and said, we love you and we may disagree with you on this, but we're, you know, we're so glad you're here. That ultimately led for me you know, to rethink things and to see things differently. That happened actually about 30 years ago for me, 30, 25 years ago. The 32% who said church was bad for their mental health. You know, I think the United Methodist Church is a place where when people come, when we radically love people, I think they feel that and they sense that, and it should be a place where people find this is good for their mental health, not bad. And I think about the 30, the sexual abuse scandals among clergy, and, and it's not that we don't have them in the United Methodist Church, but we do have systems in place to try to prevent this from happening in our denomination. Finally, 30% of the church's uh, people left because the church is polarizing politics. And I think this is important too. You know, unfortunately, on the right, we find a lot of hyper-polarizing politics, but we can also find that sometimes on the far left if we're not careful. And we can find that in the way we talk. And I, at, a, at the church where I serve, we are we did a poll several years ago. We're 40% Republican, 40% Democrat, and 20% Independent. And we are in a red county and a red state, so that's a pretty unusual blend of people. And, um, and that means that we are respectful of each other. We try to listen for one another, and we try to learn from one another. And that also means that when I speak about things, I'm going to speak about them in a way that it, that tries to show respect to people on a, on a side other than my own. And I think that's what we do well as United Methodists, as people of the VIA media. Uh, so I want to mention just a couple last things, with just some concrete ideas. Um, there are three big things about who we are as United Methodists that I think are can be very appealing for the 40 million people who dropped out of church. And the first one is, again, that we are a faith for critical thinkers. And so we need to live into that. We need to remember that and live into that. You know, in America, we have 113 colleges and universities and seminaries, uh, including 11 historically black colleges that were started by Methodists to say, we believe in the intellect and faith and bringing those together. And so our churches should reflect that. And as they reflect that, I think we're going to have a chance to reach and connect with people. And again, wrestling with doubt is a part of that. Um, 
so that's the first. The second one is that we're a church that uh, a faith that that loves radically. And I think to the degree that we remember that, that John Wesley was, uh, there are some who've called him the uh, the apostle of love. There are some who've spoken of him as using a hermeneutic of love. Uh, I was reading one of his sermons today, focusing on this. This is my topic for this weekend sermon. And um, and our sanctification, our, our aim in the Christian life is to be perfected in love. I mean, to the degree that we are that kind of community, that we are, you know, that we are welcoming and recognizing today's, I mean, I think about the Wesleys going to the prisons and caring for people, or, or Charles Wesley singing to those who are about to be executed, or the you know the coal miners, all these folks, you know, Wesley being more vile to go where the people were, and his interest was in the very people that Jesus was interested in, and those that's those who were pushed away from faith and to embrace them and to demonstrate deep love for them. And if we are a community that loves radically, we have a great future. There's not a human being alive today, and none of those 40 million who don't want to be loved. Everybody wants to be loved. And to the degree that we demonstrate that kind of love, when people walk on our doors, they feel it, they sense that from us, not judgment, but love, we have a future. And to the degree that we forget that, and we just, you know, we live like Pharisees, or at least the Pharisees that they're portrayed in the New Testament, we don't have a future. And so that's the second one. And the third one is that we are a faith community that's bent on healing the broken world. And so what I love about Methodism, everywhere I've traveled around the world, I've been on, you know, in mission and teaching and leadership uh, little tiny communities in Honduras and in Africa and in uh, Ukraine and Poland and South Africa, as well as Zimbabwe and Zambia and a whole host of other places. And everywhere I find Methodists, they always know that we are not saved, rescued, delivered, simply to have a personal relationship with Jesus. But that must turn itself into doing good works. It must turn itself into letting our light so shine that others might see the work that we're doing in Christ to bring healing to the world, and they're drawn to that. And what I find is non-religious and nominally religious people today, uh, so in Kansas City, even people who don't go to church, the people who know us and know about us, say we so respect the fact that you care about the public schools in Kansas City and the millions you've invested there. We so care about the fact that you are engaged in trying to you know, support and raise up preschools. You are so moved by the fact that you care about refugees and that you're engaged in, in work with refugees, that our primary thing is to know and love God, but knowing and loving God leads us to do the work of Christ, to, to embody or incarnate God's love, and to close the gap between the world as it is and the world as it's supposed to be. So I just want to say, for all of those reasons, I'm excited about the future of the United Methodist Church if we remember who we are and we actually live that. Uh, we do have some hard times ahead of us. Take away all that we've just been through and, and the loss of 25% of our churches in the U.S., we have, I'm guessing, another 10,000 churches that over the next 20 years are probably going to close. You know, we look at churches here in Kansas City that once were prevailing churches, and now they're down a third the size that they were 20 years ago or 30 years ago when we started the resurrection. And so there are things that are going to have to change in those churches. We're going to lose some. They're just That's just going to happen over time. But, you know, the question I have is just what are we going to do to create churches that are able to capitalize upon the best of who we are to reach the people who are non-religious and nominally religious today. I'm going to mention uh, just quickly in rapid succession a few of the things I think that's going to take. So Methodism in the 18th century was known for its excellent preaching. And uh, when we, when you looked in the Church of England, if you remember the Church of England, you wanted the sacraments and beautiful historic worship, you went to the the Church of England. But then if you wanted great preaching, you went to the preaching house of the Methodists somewhere, and you had a chance to hear some really powerful, moving preaching. And I think we're going to have to reclaim that. I, I think most of us as pastors think we're really good preachers, but we all probably could use a little improvement. And so figuring out how do we improve our, our skills and our abilities there, and how do we have preaching and worship, how do we focus the attention and time to be able to have sermons and worship that moves the hearts of people and draws them to come back after their first visit. Meaningful care. We've got to do an excellent job of caring for people, especially so many broken people and people who've left churches because they felt like it, it harmed them mentally. It was not good for their mental health. Today we have, especially among younger people, an increasing number of people who are, who are recognizing and or um, stating clearly that they're struggling with mental health issues. What are we going to do about that as faith communities? Uh, passionate service to the community. So, so it's easy when our churches begin to get smaller we, and, and are declining that we circle the wagons and we've got these resources, limited resources. We've got to figure out sometimes how do we just keep the doors open? How do we keep doing what we're doing? And somewhere in there, we've got to be able to figure out how are we turning, what, however small our church is, whatever we've got, how are we turning those people loose on serving the community and the world? That's part of our strength. 
And then the last two things I'll say I think are really pivotal. St. Paul School of Theology is located at Church of the Resurrection, uh, our, our Leewood campus. And when I walk down the hallways, I see about 20% of the students show up in person and all the rest of the students show up online. And when I was at Perkins, uh, similar, similar numbers at Perkins, I went to the Perkins Chapel a few months back and I'm like, where is everybody? When I was here, this chapel was full. Where are all the students? Well, they're all online. If that's true when it comes to going to seminary, and it's true, increasingly true going to college, it's also going to be true for a lot of people when it comes to going to church. And so people's first exposure is going to be coming online. Uh, people's, uh, when they age out of being able to come and worship, it's going to be being online. And so figuring out how are we doing online and doing it well, I think is going to be crit critical. And the last thing I'm going to say is starting new faith communities. So i got 60 seconds left, and a uh, minute, 14 seconds, I'm sorry. And uh, new faith communities... Uh, reach new people. We have in Kansas City a hundred over a hundred United Methodist churches in Kansas City in the in the thirty mile radius from downtown Kansas City, and a number of those churches are not going to make it. And so the question we're asking is, we've got buildings in the right places, but sometimes we have churches that aren't going to make it. And how do we look to larger churches or healthier churches to say, can we go start a new faith community in a building that's not going to make it anymore? And so Resurrection has done that by having multiple locations or campuses. Not everybody can do that, but I've known of, of churches with 100 to 200 people a Sunday who did this in a second location. And so today we have six locations. We'll have four more over the next uh, next probably four years. And those locations, one of those was a church that had 60 a Sunday, and now it's running 400 a Sunday. One of them was running 150 a Sunday, and now they're running 350 a Sunday. One of them was down to 45 a Sunday, and they're running 250 a Sunday. And so these are churches that are reaching new people as we've tried to take resources and pour into them. And I just think this is gonna be really pivotal as we look to the future, is instead of just having churches close and that's it, how do we look to churches that can help create vital congregations that are a part of, in essence, the, uh, the model that Methodism began with, and that is circuits. And these are circuits, but the circuits look a little different. We use technology now to, to have somebody preaching and we, use, we make sure that there are great lay people trained to be shepherding those congregations and see what can be doing, done in the future. All right, that's all I got. I, uh, I'm so grateful to have a chance to be here, and I can't wait to hear what others say about what's happening at General Conference. But I, for one, believe that we have the right approach to the gospel for the 21st century if we remember it and we practice it well. And I'm excited about what's going to be happening, what I believe will happen at General Conference this year. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. So good to have you with us. I loved what you had to say. Thank you for your ministry, your passion, your witness. and. Um, so much of what you said, I'm going to be touching on. But before I begin, I just have to let you all know that I've been scrolling through the participant list, and I'm so grateful to see the names of so many friends and companions that I've journeyed with over the decades as we've sought a more inclusive church. It is so good to see your names, if not your faces. I want to offer a deep thanks to the members of the United Methodist Association of Retired Clergy. You had a vision nearly eight years ago when I arrived, and you have been so faithful, not only in your support of my ministry and of me and Robin, but also to your commitment of a vision for the church that you've held since you were active clergy, that of a fully inclusive church. So many of us in the Mountain Sky Conference and across the connection stand on your shoulders with great gratitude. As I've been considering the topic of this webinar, a couple of things come to mind, a couple of things uh, that I've been reflecting on. The first was a comment made by one of my professors when I was a PhD student at Drew University. Karen Brown was a brilliant professor. Her field was anthropology of religion, and we who were her students hung on every word whenever she lectured, in part because we didn't always understand her words. She was that brilliant but also because she broke open our worldview and gave us a new lens in which to study the church and the world. One time as we were reflecting on the rise and fall of cultures and society, she said, the United States has barely entered into its adolescence as a nation. The question is, will we be able to survive it? That was more than 30 years ago. It feels as if we're now squarely situated in our adolescence as a nation, all the behaviors of high school feel like they've been embedded in every single system and institution in our nation. The way it's become perfectly acceptable to mock those who are different, to bully your way to the top, to not just create, but cement 
and stone in groups and out groups. Democracy, the very bedrock of the United States feels as if it's literally hanging by a thread. And now Dr. Brown's words haunt me. Will we survive our adolescence as a nation? Over the past couple of years, that adolescent behavior that we see in American society has been reflected in our own beloved denomination. People have been literally passing notes to others through leaflets and anonymous emails and blog posts, smearing people's reputations. Lies have been spoken enough that they have been accepted as truth. There has been a, an undermining of our Wesleyan tradition. The seeds of distrust to any denominational authority has choked us as we watch the very people doing the undermining, jockeying for positions of power and the acquisition of money. And so my question becomes, will we as a denomination survive our adolescence? When I was a pastor at Bethany United Methodist Church in San Francisco, a small but mighty congregation that had been committed to inclusion since the 1960s and 70s, Major leaders of the gay liberation movement of the time were members of Bethany, including Herb Donaldson, the first openly municipal court judge, Sally Gearhart, the grandmother of the lesbian feminist movement, Rick Stokes, who was a board member to our own church and society, who actually helped craft some of the original social principles, and who was the other gay candidate running against Harvey Milk. The congregation was firmly aware of its identity, particularly in relationship to a denomination that had regularly reaffirmed that the lives and loves of LGBTQIA plus people were considered incompatible with Christian teaching. In the 12 years that I was pastor, we witnessed locally and throughout the church of what it meant to be a fully inclusive church. We even wrote a book that was given to every bishop in the United Methodist Church where members told their story of the blessings they experienced in being part of a church that welcomed everyone. LGBTQ and straight, rich and poor, people of color, immigrants, young and old. We didn't just witness to the church, however. We marched in pride. And even more importantly, we had booths at pride as well as the Castro Street Fair so that we could share God's love and bring a healing presence of hope to those whom the church had done so much harm. But then something upset our equilibrium. Trinity United Methodist Church that stood in the Castro District, the gay district of San Francisco, had been torched by an arsonist because of their commitment to be in ministry with HIV AIDS folks. They lost their building and for many years worshiped in another church. But because we had similar commitments to full inclusion, the bishop and the district superintendent decided to merge our congregations. Trinity brought a small congregation, but also the empty lot their church once stood on, which was the only empty lot on Olive Market Street, which is San Francisco's main drag. It was worth a lot of money. We were told to do something creative with it or give it back to the annual conference. This created incredible conflict in the church. We were comfortable. We thought we understood our call from God. We didn't want to grow and change. The frustration and conflict became so great that we brought in a consultant to help uncover God's new call, to begin to see together a vision for ministry that God might have for us. Tim Forbes, a United Methodist elder from Ohio, was our consultant. And as he listened to us tell our experience of church and our hesitancy to change, he said this, church, what are you going to be? when you grow up. I have to say that knocked the wind out of us. Truly, we were stuck in an earlier phase of development as a church and were unwilling to allow God to melt us, mold us, fill us, and use us in new ways. So both of these stories come back to give me pause. United Methodist Church, we've been through, moving through an ugly adolescence. Who is God calling us to be when we grow up? We're in the season of Eastertide. From that very first morning where, of an empty tomb, people kept overlooking Jesus even when he was staring them right in the face. Whether it was at the tomb or the Emmaus Road, the disciples couldn't grasp that resurrection had actually happened. And now everything, everything had changed. 
They clung to what was even when it was not life-giving anymore. They were drowning in their grief and couldn't let go. They were not willing to grow up in faith. We in the United Methodist Church have had our share of grief as people we've shared our pews, pulpits, and prayers with have left us because we had the audacity to believe that God loves everyone and calls all sorts of people, including queer folk, into ordained ministry. Have we finally moved through our adolescence? Are we willing to grow more deeply as followers of Jesus? Are we willing and open to see the risen Christ in faces and experiences that aren't like our own? We're in a post-disaffiliation era as a denomination. We are like those disciples, no longer recognizing the risen Christ in our midst. We no longer know who we are anymore. As we approach General Conference, can we use this as an opportunity to solidify unity in the midst of the great diversity that exists in our denomination? And I believe that diversity, yes, even theological diversity, is a blessing and a gift and makes us all more faithful. I believe that if we're able to embrace this, we will be a far bolder and brighter witness of God's generous grace in our broken world than we have been for a really long time. It's time for us to grow up and be the fully inclusive church that reflects the great diversity found in the body of Christ. This is the work we have to do, whether as a general conference delegate, a lay person, clergy, or even a bishop. We are living in a new and unfamiliar reality. But we clergy women used to sing in the 1980s this line, we are living tomorrow today. The future of an inclusive church is already a lived reality, whether or not we can recognize and or embrace that truth. As I've shared before in these webinars, queer people have been a part of the Wesleyan movement since its very beginning. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, befriended a man charged with sodomy and impris was imprisoned in England. John Wesley wrote about him 30 times in his journals, never with condemnation, and also requested that one of his class meetings support the man. If only this denomination had continued to meet people where they are and create ministry from that point, rather, rather than from a mythical place of purity. Because even though people have tried through legislation and law to keep queer people out of the denomination, the mystery of God's call has reached queer people throughout our history. People have asked me, what's it been like to be the first gay bishop? And I've had to reply, I'm not the first gay bishop. I'm just the first gay bishop who's been able to be out. There have been faithful and beloved gay bishops before me. And there have also been queer youth group leaders, choir members, clergy, Sunday school teachers, general secretaries, and more who have served faithfully yet silently. Just last week, I met with a group of largely closeted clergy in our Southern jurisdictions. There in the South are connected more than 60 queer clergy who are out to one another. I can't tell you how totally inspired I was by that group, for they've been willing to give the church all they have, even when the church has tried to close its doors on them. Our wards of ordained ministries have found them to possess the gifts and graces for ordained ministry, and they have been willing to pay a high price of silence and closet dwelling in order to be faithful to their calls. It's time that we in the United Methodist Church learned about the history of queer people in our life and ministry and simply be out about it all so that, so that those who are currently closeted can come out. It's not easy. The work of a fully inclusive church takes much introspection and examination. Just as we continue to wrestle with our racism as a largely white denomination, we have to wrestle as well with our homophobia and heterosexism. And it takes a lot of vigilance. You know, I'm aware every day I have to confess the sin of racism because every day I walk out my door and the world puts on me a cloak of racial privilege. 
The culture in and out of the church provides me with reinforcements to enjoy that privilege that I have to continually confront if I am to be an ally against racial injustice and oppression. That justice work continues as we deal with individual and systemic homophobia and heterosexism because there is an intersectionality of oppressions. In order to become a fully inclusive church, we need to rethink how we do ministry and engage one another. The starting point for ministry should always be the place where the hurt is greatest. We must open ourselves to the lived realities of those whose lives are so different from our own and yet are impacted by the racism, homophobia, heterosexism, ageism, ableism, classism, whatever ism we have without thought embodied that holds a foot against the neck of our siblings. It's been quite sobering as a bishop to see the work that's left undone, the work that we must engage if we are to live into beloved community God calls us to co-create. I have been stunned when I have heard a church leader say without critical reflection, well, we just can't place a person of color in that church or the pain a queer clergy person experiences when they go to what they thought was a safe, reconciling church, but soon realize they, they've never lived more threatened lives as a queer person. These truths provide us with our marching orders. If we are to be a fully inclusive church, we build it from the ground up. I know that's a strange thing for a bishop to say, but this allows those that are too often marginalized in the power structures to have agency and voice. It allows their life experience to form us as a faith community, which I know is not the way General Conference works. So what are my thoughts as we prepare for General Conference? My prayer is that we spend some time getting to know one another before we do legislative work, because we don't know each other, and we don't know what our church looks like anymore. I hope we spend time in prayer, worship, study, and celebration. May we break bread together both at the altar and around tables. May laughter be as, as abundant as the baked cookies our North Carolina hosts are undoubtedly preparing for us. I believe this is important because we've experienced so much trauma as a denomination. Disaffiliation. COVID, wars, political divisions, climate catastrophes, human rights violations. We all carry this and more in our bodies as we make our way to Charlotte. It has been five long years since we last gathered and we carry the trauma of that experience as well. We have much healing to do. If we move too quickly into Robert's rigid rules of order, we fail to take the time to find pathways to spiritual wholeness and allow the Holy Spirit to bind us together. As a result, the rules we wind up creating become stifling and suffocating. It is in relationship with one another, and this is key to who we are as United Methodists. It is in relationship with one another, not in the rules we create that allow a new and more inclusive church to emerge. One reason why the United Methodist Church has been able to maintain exclusive policies related to queer people is because we have codified the erasure of queer people and our lives from the larger church. So our relationship with us has been difficult and rules have been made about us, but not with us. It began in 1972 when the social principles was amended on the floor to change a purely pastoral statement about gay people into one of condemnation with the addition of, however, we believe that homosexual behavior is incompatible from, with Christian teaching. That became the fulcrum upon which all the other anti-queer policies rested. The ordination ban was perfectly logical, as well as the holy union ban. Why would we bless someone or, some, or their relationship if they were incompatible with Christian teaching? And it astounds me that a denomination that is so committed to education and intellectual pursuit accepted a prohibition against using funds to just mention homosexuality. That stifled our inquiry. 
It silenced gay voices, gay experience, and gay people from bringing their full selves to inform the larger body. And we as a church are less because of it. It's been 50 years of largely silenced and absent gay voices. The church has so much to learn from its queer kin. We have withstood the erasure, the silencing, the lies and misconception about our lives. Yet we have sought to remain faithful to this church, this church that's nurtured us when we were young and even as it began to turn its back on us as we grew into the people God created us to be. We have so much to offer. We can teach about the cost of discipleship, about how love can flourish and grow even when given so little societal support, about faithfulness even when we're rejected and despised. Have we passed through our adolescence? Are we willing to grow up and live into the questions of faith more than simple, to, to live into the questions of faith more than live into simple yet incomplete answers? Are we able to recognize the risen Christ in the lives of those who aren't like us? Can we accept another's reality even when it is so different from our own? So Carrie Newcomer has a song I'm singing as Charlotte General Conference approaches. She sings, if not now, tell me when. If not now, tell me when. We may never see this moment or place in time again. If not now, tell me when. It will take a change of heart for this to mend. It will take a change of heart for this to mend. But miracles do happen every shining now and then. If not now, tell me when. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, uh, Bishop Oliveto, my former pastor from, <laughs> from that church that you just spoke about in San Francisco and our, uh, our, uh, our efforts to be made new. Um, my name is Randall Miller, and uh, I, I wanted to talk with you about our, um, our, our way of moving forward as we move uh, as we uh, move towards General Conference in, in Charlotte, which is only just a couple of weeks away, uh, but has uh, been five long years in the making, which have seemed like 12 long years <laughs> in the making. <laughs> so uh, I'm, a, I'm a, a lay person from the California Nevada Annual Conference, a former member of Bethany United Methodist Church in San Francisco, Current member of um, of uh, Epworth United Methodist Church in Berkeley, uh, and a member of the Strategy Group, and I want to talk with you about that. Uh, I'm going to switch to sharing my screen, which is always kind of a perilous thing. So uh, hold with me; You're, you won't get lost. I promise. Uh, there may be moments of chaos and confusion, but we'll get through them. Uh, which is a good model for the uh, United Methodist Church. Um, all right, so uh, I uh, I am intrigued and um, uh, uh, awe filled by the title of today's forum: the resurrection of an inclusive church. Uh, in some ways, the resurrection of something implies that. Uh, uh, we are uh, going back and resurrecting essentials that have always been there, and I'm not sure that that has been the case, um, but uh, uh, it is Eastertide, and who doesn't need uh, a good resurrection? Um, I uh, One of my favorite uh, prophets who came out of uh, a uh, evangelical Pentecostal church as a child preacher uh, is James Baldwin. And uh, one of my uh, favorite uh, quotations from James Baldwin, uh, Baldwin is, you got to be a witness, a witness to whence you came and where you are going to what you have seen and the possibilities that you think you see, you got to be a witness. 
So I wanted to just start out by sharing that uh, I have been engaged in the struggle for LGBTQ plus inclusion and other kinds of inclusion uh, for 40 years now, 40 years of general conferences. Uh, and um, uh, through that period, um, I have witnessed a lot. I think the movement uh, uh, that was about the support uh, and the inclusion of LGBT people has gone through uh, various fa phases of our movement and growth. Uh, we started out by just uh, the small number of us, what felt like a very small number 40 years ago, started out by just resisting. Uh, we never imagined that we could change the face of the church at that point. Uh, in fact, we used to sing this song uh, with each other, can we be like drops of water wearing away the stone? Um, that was our earliest period and period of resistance. And then the Reconciling uh, Congregation Program was formed, which is the earliest version of the Reconciling Ministries Network. And we moved into this period of amazing growth. Uh, it wasn't that we were uh, uh, fully accepted within the church that hasn't come yet, but it was this amazing period where uh, LGBTQ plus people and our allies could share the stories of what God was doing in our lives, about what it meant to come out as openly uh, gay and lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer folk, uh, and to reclaim our sense of spirituality and to not only resist what was happening in the United Methodist Church, but to uh, embrace our spiritual callings, whatever they were, and go back to the United Methodist Church as missionaries uh, of inclusion and justice uh, and a new way of doing church. And now we come to a period where we're standing on the threshold of a new phase of our life together as United Methodist. Uh, and that is worth uh, talking about and it's worth celebrating. 40 years and 40 years and 40 years. Uh, and I just remember all of the folks uh, uh, on this journey of 40 years as we have attempted to make the United Methodist Church more inclusion. I uh, remember, celebrate, uh, and look back in awe on all of the all of those, many of the folks who are in this webinar, but others who have come and gone, some who have gone on to glory, uh, who have worked for inclusion. Um, this evening, I'm speaking as a member of the strategy group. Uh, we, uh, we were created uh, uh, almost immediately after the disastrous uh, General Conference, special session of the General Conference in 2019 that passed the traditional plan uh, that uh, added more burdens and more restrictions on both LGBTQ people in the church and our straight allies. Um, the 2019 General Conference was not only a disaster for LGBTQ folks or queer folks, uh, it was also a disaster uh, for our church, uh, a disaster which we have never fully recovered from. It started the much uh, sped up timeline that we're living in now, where we have moved from crisis to crisis in the United Methodist Church, particularly at our, our, our general conference and international levels of the church. The strategy group came out of the 2019 uh, special session of the general conference. Uh, we call ourselves a coalition of the willing. If you want labels, we span from center right to left in the church uh, to or progressive in the church. Uh, we are a coalition, again, of the willing. We are fully committed to the United Methodist Church, uh, and we are committed to creating a more just, equitable, and inclusive denomination that finds expression uh, within our global fellowship of United Methodist Christians. Um, so we are the folks who remain in the United Methodist Church after all the challenges, after the struggles uh, around lots of theological and social issues, but particularly around LGBT inclusion. 
Uh, so I want to talk with you uh, with my strategy group hat on, and I want to just sort of introduce you to some of our legislative uh, strategies and organizing ahead of the, the what is now the 2024 General Conference. First of all, uh, if you haven't realized it yet, the General Conference is coming after and, and coming in a time of great urgency for the United Methodist Church. Um, over the past uh, 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 five years, it should say a five-year delay, uh, we've un been unable to meet as a general conference due to the COVID-19 pandemic and unable to uh, meet with other delegates in person. So if you're out there on this webinar uh, or on the panel and you're a general conference delegate or a reserve delegate, you're part of one of the longest delegation his, uh, delegation uh, histories that there ever have been. It feels like we have been prepping forever for a general conference that felt like it would never come. Um, during the period uh, in which we've been waiting for general conference, we've undergone a church uh, schism in all but name. Um, we've lost, as uh, uh, Adam Hamilton said, 25% of uh, United Methodist congregations have left us uh, over the issue of uh, uh, inclusion or exclusion of LGBTQ plus people. Uh, others have left because of other uh, theological uh, matters, uh, and some have left because uh, we are always in the church dealing with issues of power and control. Um, the most heavily impacted part of the church with uh, the United Methodist congregations leaving are the southern parts of our church. Um, uh, although uh, churches have left us from throughout the US, but the southern, southern parts of the church have been devastated and heavily impacted. And those departures have triggered in turn significant financial shortfalls so that the general budget of the church uh, is being, uh, is being has been greatly revised uh, and uh, we have become almost overnight, it says, uh, it seems uh, a, a much leaner church than we have been in the past. Uh, and then um, I, I would say that, uh, uh, that the United Methodist Church has been in a crisis of identity for a long, long time, but there is no doubt that we have uh, our crisis of identity of who we are as United Methodist Christians uh, uh, has uh, uh, deepened during this period of schisms and um, delays and uh, disaffiliations and churches leaving uh, and um, waiting for the general conference. Um, uh, as uh, both uh, 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 Reverend Hamilton and Bishop Oliveto suggested, the General Conference is not a panacea. It is not the fix-all for all of our problems. Uh, so before getting uh, to just a quick review of our legislative strategy, I just want to give the caution that it seems to me that actually we're not dealing with a legislative problem in the United Methodist Church. We do need to change some things in the Book of Discipline, don't get me wrong, but we really are dealing with a kind of spiritual, spiritual malaise, a kind of spiritual identity crisis about who we are and whose we are. Uh, and uh, at a very fundamental basis, we need to get uh, greater clarity about who we are as a United Methodist Church, who we want to be in the world, who we want to include within the uh, broad umbrella of the United Methodist Church, and what impact um, that we have want to have on the broader world. Um, I cobbled together a couple of um, really great, I think they're really great uh, quotations that I've heard over the years about general conference, uh, about general conferences. Uh, one is that the best le legislative strategy cannot repair the afflictions of heart, mind, and soul. Um, so uh, I will say that I've been going to general conferences again for uh, 40 years now. Uh, and not a one of them has <laughs> repaired the afflictions that of my uh, heart, mind, and soul. In some ways, they've deepened those afflictions. 
Uh, another quotation that I love is that an every four-year conference, general conference normally happens every four years, and every four-year conference cannot replace a commitment to living right, meaning that if we're not, if we're unwilling to uh, treat each other well in between the four years of general conference, coming together and meeting and worshiping uh, every four years is unlikely to um, to uh, uh, fix what is uh, essentially um, broken and needs to be repaired within the United Methodist Church. And my final quote that I love is, given all of these limitations of General Conference, nevertheless, it is necessary for us to strategize, to think together about what kind of church we want to be, and uh, prayerfully and hopefully to enact uh, changes in the United Methodist Church so that we can become a uh, more inclusive, just, and equitable global fellowship. So um, the strategy group, as I ha have said, has been meeting for the last uh, four to five years, uh, and uh, we have uh, going into general conference, we've developed what we call the three R's strategy. Uh, and so uh, the three R strategy stands for the major pieces of legislation that the strategy group and many other groups and people going into general conference are supporting. Uh, and those three R's are regionalization, the revised social principles, and the removal of the harmful language. So those are the three R's, regionalization, revised social principles, and removal of the harmful language. Um, I am positive that the, the friends and colleagues who are coming after me in, in their presentations are going to talk about one or all of these strategies. So uh, my purpose here today is just to introduce those who haven't heard this language about the three R's strategy, give you a little snapshot and tell you a little bit of what we're expecting when we get to the general conference this year. So first of all, uh, as I think you'll hear from uh, Izzy Alvaron, especially, um, we, uh, the, the general conference is considering proposals that would restructure the decision-making in the United Methodist Church and restructure our worldwide relationships. Um, most importantly to me in terms of the, uh, what uh, worldwide regionalization would do is it would help us begin to address the legacies of colonialism that have taken place uh, over the last, uh, uh, over the period that the United Methodist Church has been in existence. So that we, we know that we have had, had missionaries and dealings with parts of uh, the United Methodist Church outside of uh, the U.S. Uh, that have been wonderful. And we know that there have been terrible things that have happened uh, uh, around the world uh, that have accompanied our witness and presence in the United Methodist Central Conferences. Those are the areas outside of the U.S. So as I said, the regionalization is organized around the principles of self-governance and self-determination. It would give ge uh, seven geographical regions of the church some level of decision-making and power, which not all of them enjoy now. It would allow for a general conference to continue. That's a worldwide assembly of United Methodists who were elected from their annual conferences to attend uh, a worldwide uh, legislative body but it also would allow for regional conferences uh, and those regional conferences uh, happening in different parts of the world would allow uh, different regions of the church to be more responsive and more contextual in their decision-making. Uh, they would be, the theory is that they would be closer to the ground or the principle is that they would be closer to the ground and closer to local context and that their decision making would be therefore more responsive and more, uh, more responsive to what's happening 
uh, in the uh, in mission and ministry in those geographical locations. Um, like other geographical regions, um, the U.S. would also have begin to have the power to uh, adapt the uh, adapt the Book of Discipline and begin to, uh, for the first time, have power to make decisions uh, for the U.S. region of the Church. Um, and uh, this sounds very paradoxical, but by giving the U.S. power to make decisions about the U.S. region of the Church, it actually reduces the chances that the U.S. will continue to dominate the General Conference, which is supposed to be a place where all regions of the Church deal with matters that affect all regions of the church. So again, a regionalization, worldwide regionalization, which you'll hear from some of my other colleagues, is the first of the three R strategy. We want to pass worldwide regionalization and restructure our decision making and relationships uh, within the general church um, to reflect more uh, regional decision making power. The next uh, of the three R's that I want to talk about, or the three R strategy I want to talk about, is the revised social principle. Um, so this is uh, something that is very near and dear to my heart. I could take up all of my friends and colleagues' times who are coming after me to talk about the revised social principles, but I'm quite sure that they would uh, pull out the hook and pull me off screen if I were to do that. So I'll just say, that the, uh, and another important piece of legislation coming to the General Conference is the revised social principles. The revised social principles uh, uh, took play, uh, arose out of an eight-year process that was uh, uh, requested by the 2012 General Conference um, and now has been delayed for additional years. Uh, during that eight-year timeline, uh, the General Board of Church and Society conducted listening posts, consultations, online feedback, diverse writing teams, and uh, throughout that eight years engaged more than 4,000 United Methodists uh, in the process of the, in the process of revising the social principles um, uh, um, uh, and moving us forward. And the goal of the revision of the social principles were to make the social principles, which are a core statement of our theological and uh, social beliefs. Um, the goal of the, revising the social principles was to make them more globally responsive, theologically grounded, and more succinct. So if you're interested in uh, actually reading the revised social principles, all you have to do is in a in your browser type in United Methodist Revised Social Principles, and it will take you to the website that's been developed by the General Board of Church and Society um, uh, to um, showcase not only the revised social principles themselves, but the process that uh, that uh, led us uh, into the that led us through the revision process. Um, in another forum like this, I called the revised social principles um, a, love, a love letter from uh, United Methodist to United Methodist, because it really is a love letter uh, for those of us who have chosen deliberately to stay in the United Methodist Church, um, the time, energy, and commitment of those 4,000 United Methodists involved in the revision process is a love letter to the church. Uh, and I'm so grateful for that that love letter has come at a time when we are um, seeking to reaffirm, reaffirm our identities, our identity as United Methodists. Um, the last plank or the last R of the three R strategy is to re remove all of the anti-LGBT provisions from the Book of Discipline. So uh, for those of you who don't know, um, uh, but are uh, committed or passionate about inclusion, uh, we have spent 48 years 
uh, in the United Methodist Church of adding provisions to um, the our book of discipline and adding exclusionary language about LGBTQ plus people to the our United Methodist book of discipline. Um, and I, I guess I would pause and just ask you, 40 year, 48 years of perfecting exclusionary policies, what else could we have done with that 48 years of time and energy and conflicts and battles over exclusionary language? Um, that, uh, uh, that harmful language still exists in the United Methodist official policies in the, in the uh, United Methodist Book of Discipline, although large parts of Methodism in the United States uh, are uh, holding many of those policies in abeyance, uh, we still need to remove them officially from the United Methodist Book of Discipline. Um, the last 48 years have seen the devastating effects of complaints and trials and turning people away from the United Methodist Church. And I think a question that we all need to ask ourselves, is that what we really want to spend the next 50 years doing? Or do we wanna uh, uh, make a change in what we're doing to allow um, uh, the spirit of God to uh, to fall on us and lead us into more exciting and engaging and inclusive ministries. Uh, hold on for just a second and let me just kind of fix my screen a bit. So the removal of the anti-LGBT provisions is the third and last plank of uh, the three R strategy. So I want to tell you about where we think we are right now and how we could find a way forward. So I just want to say very clearly um, that for the first time uh, in the time that I, in the 40 years that I've been going to General Conference, it's very clear that the vast majority of U.S. delegates to the General Conference, 80% or, or more, support the removal of the discrimin discriminatory language from the Book of Discipline. Um, that is a significant milestone. And beyond that, uh, we believe, and we know that the opponents of inclusion in the United Methodist Church believe, that a majority of general conference delegates for the first time will vote to remove most if not all of the harmful language from the United Methodist Book of Discipline. Let me just repeat that. We believe that for the first time in 40 years, a majority of general conference delegates will vote to remove most, if not all of the harmful language from the Book of Discipline. Uh, that does not mean that all of our, uh, the majority of general conference delegates believe uh, uh, or, or have moved to an affirmative position in terms of the inclusion of LGBTQ plus people, but it does mean that a majority of general conference delegates are troubled by this particular aspect of our church, or they're tired of the conflict that has divided us uh, for 40, 48 long years in the United Methodist Church, or they know and love LGBTQ plus people and uh, want to affirm uh, the LGBT plus people just like me who are living and loving and worshiping in the United Methodist Church. Um, so we are standing uh, as... Uh, uh, as uh, the writer of uh, Angels in America would say, we are standing on the very threshold of change in the United Methodist Church. I just want to pause um, before I go on uh, and just acknowledge that uh, for some of this, for some of us, this change has been 48 years in the making uh, and that uh, in that 48 years of working to remove the harmful language in the United Methodist Church, we had almost given up hope 
uh, that our church would change, that our church would embrace us, uh, that our church would uh, understand full inclusion, not only for LGBTQ plus people, but inclusion for all those who have been marginalized uh, and colonized and injured by the church. Uh, again, um, the writer of Angels in America says, we are standing on the very threshold. I actually think he says we are standing on the very threshold of revelation, but we are standing on the very threshold of change. Uh, and in a uh, at another time, I could weep for all that uh, this um, the movement for full inclusion has cost us as a church and cost LGBTQ plus people and our allies personally and professionally. We are standing on the very threshold of change. I also want to quickly go on to say, as I kind of wind up uh, our time together, to also acknowledge that um, just because the majority of, of general conference delegates appear to be ready to remove the harmful language from the United Methodist Book of Discipline, that doesn't mean, mean our work is done or that everyone who will remain in the United Methodist Church uh, will stay, uh, will, uh, will be happy about the changes that we're, uh, that we are making. We have to begin to uh, understand how to live with our differences, how to uh, learn to grow together in faith and understanding, and how to engage in gener generative conflict. So we do disruptive conflict in the United Methodist Church very well. We've spent 48 years of, uh, our, of our time together in the United Methodist Church engaged in disruptive conflict that breaks down people, that disallows um, a forward movement in terms of mission and ministry, that blocks the flow of the Holy Spirit moving in and amongst us. But generative conflict, um, that we don't know very much about as a United Methodist Church. Uh, and so as we move forward, the, the goal is not to um, pretend that we all agree or that we are all uniformly on the same page about LGBT inclusion or, or anything else uh, except our commitment to Jesus as the Christ. The goal is to engage in conflict in ways that generate more possibilities, greater connection, and fuller in, in expression instead of shutting these things down. I'll just say it again. The goal is not to pretend that we're all on the same page or that we all think alike or that we all have the same perspectives and opinions. The goal is to learn to engage in conflict in ways that generate more possibilities, greater connection, and fuller expression instead of shutting all of these things down. I want to, my time is up, and I wanted to just close um, by reading these prophetic words um, from the, from the, revised social principles draft that will be before the general conference in upcoming weeks. Uh, and keep in mind this uh, this preamble, I'm gonna quote, I'm gonna read from the preamble of the revised social principles, just a paragraph or two. Um, and it was written before all of the schisms and disaffiliations in the United Methodist Church uh, had begun. And so this is the paragraph uh, from the preamble of the United Methodist Revised Social Principles. We acknowledge that the church is a living body gathered from the many and diverse parts of the human community. Thus, un unanimity of beliefs, opinion, and practice have never been characteristic of the church from the earliest beginnings. Instead, from its earliest times, as witnessed in the Gospels, 
Paul's letters, the Acts of the Apostles, and the other New Testament texts, diverse understandings and controversies on many matters have been the reality in the church. Therefore, with sign whenever significant differences of opinion occur among Christians, some of which continue to divide the church deeply today, faithful Christians need to face their disagreements and even their despair and not cover differences with false claims of consensus or unanimity. unanimity. On the contrary, the church needs to embrace conflicts with courage and perseverance as we seek together to discern God's will. With that understanding and commitment, we pledge ourselves to acknowledge and to embrace with courage, trust, and hope those controversies that arise among us, accepting them as evidence that God is not yet finished in sculpting us to be God's people. Recognizing that God is our creator, redeemer, and, sus and sustainer, we seek to center our lives and witness on God. We are confident that nothing can separate us from the grace of God and that the social witness of the church is a testimony to that grace. With God's help, we pledge to share ministry and honor everyone's dignity, even when we disagree. To seek the mind of Christ and to follow God's will in all things. So thank you uh, very much for this time with you. And uh, I look forward to hearing my uh, fellow panelists uh, as they uh, bring us deeper into um, our preparation for General Conference and uh, the resurrection of a fully inclusive church. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Randall, for handing it off to me. Um with some words of hope. I, I would like to talk about glimpses of resurrection. I, I really um, appreciate the the topic, the theme of resurrection. Uh, and I, I've i been thinking of what are the glimpses of resurrection that we've been seeing um, since our Good Friday, which could either be 1972 all the way to 2019. Um, Growing up in the Philippines, uh, I remember being excited about Holy Week because there's the school holiday. You know, <laughs> we're 85% Roman Catholic, mostly Christian, so everything's closed on Good on Good Friday and Holy Week. Um, and transportation is, of course, um, hard to get. So you can just imagine my culture shock when I uh, moved to the U.S. for grad school in 2003, that banks were open on Good Friday. <laughs> everything was open on Good Friday. It's like nothing was happening. Uh, sometimes I couldn't even find a, a seven last words service in the Methodist church, um, which I'm so, so used to. Uh, but our Good Friday, I think, has been going on um, 52 years ago. We added those words in the Book of Discipline. And then 2019, it was heightened for me because I was at Joe Conference as a staff person for Reconciling Ministries. Uh, not just an outgate clergy person. And I remember that evening when we did that vote. I, I didn't want to see anybody from a central conference. I was hiding in some dark place. And my boss said, you have to be at this hotel because the Western jurisdiction is doing a kumbaya service. I said, I don't want to go there. I don't want Bishop Kerr remembers that they were dancing, they were singing, and I was sulking in the back. Um and I felt like, oh, this church needs to die for it to have resurrection. We need to have that Good Friday, and I think we're getting it. It's been happening for the last five years. But um, but I believe that uh, uh, the eruption of grace and, and resurrection is a daily struggle. It happens every day. We just not, you just don't see it. And so I want us to be hopeful and and see it and i'm gonna go through a whole list of bullet points of of where i see this glimpses of grace because 
we do know how this story ends. We know, we know how this story ends. Of course, the the the, the, the passion of this of the Holy Week is there, but we know it ends with resurrection. It ends with Easter. But the question for us is like, when is that going to happen? It's almost it's it's like similar to what Bishop Karen was saying. When are we going to grow up? You know, when is this going to happen? So I think even resurrection might not happen immediately like we thought it would be, but it is in spurts and, you know, spasms and eruptions. But we know how this story ends. And there are always signs of new things God is creating and resurrecting. I remember in 2016, we had a queer clergy caucus that came out. Bishop Karen was there before she was bishop. I remember talking to her uh, on the way from the convention center to where we were having a gathering, and I was telling her, like, hey, aren't you considering to be a bishop? <laughs> we just all came out. She was like, I'm not doing that. Uh, in two months, she was bishop. Um, it's a sign of resurrection. When God calls, it's hard to say no. We had a love letter to the church when we all came out. We, I mean, a lot of us were on a way out, but it was like over a hundred of us that were, our faces were there. We were out, fully out. I actually had to come out to my parents January of 2016, just to be sure they're not going to hear about me being gay on YouTube or from the news. But we did come out. Uh, we still have Hidden Faithful, but we are part of a, you know, we have a, a Facebook group, a private Facebook group of over 300 queer clergy in the United Methodist Church. Imagine that, right? And we've had out gay bishops in 2016 and 2022. Bishop uh, Cedric Bridgeforth is is one of our out uh, gay bishops. That's That to me is amazing. I, I remember when, when Bishop Karen officiated communion right after her consecration, I saw myself on stage. You know, when, when that is resurrection for my soul, when you see yourself, because we're so thirsty and hungry for like space and attention and you see it, that is resurrection. And in the wake of these affiliations, the last two years, we have lighthouse churches. We have fresh expressions of churches that are coming out from the woodwork. They're, we're all coming together. It's time for the UMC Spring. I think that is also a sign of resurrection. Do you also know that we have United Methodist congregations in the Middle East? We do because we have overseas workers, immigrant workers from the Philippines who are United Methodists starting these churches. They're lay people that are pastoring them and they're now being ordained. And I think at this general conference, we're going to vote to have the Middle East uh, Mission District to be part of my Episcopal area. That's amazing work. I mean, we have Filipino missionaries in Mongolia, in Cambodia, in Laos, in Tanzania, in Italy. We used to be the one that where they send the missionaries. Now we're sending missionaries everywhere. That is a vital mission. That is resurrection. That is connectionalism too. We also have a queer delegate caucus. You know, you probably read it in the Religion News Service. There were seven self-identified LGBTQ delegates at the 2019 General Conference. Now we have 26. We tripled it. <laughs> God did. It's resurrection. Post-2019, there were petitions to dissolve or split the UMC, all coming from the United States. You probably remember the Indiana plan, all of those plans. Then Central Conference leaders came together and made their voices heard by talking about regionalization. Like, wait, you're talking about dissolving the church that I'm part of without me in the conversation. Let's offer something to you. Um, and we thought that the first, and I was, I've was i been telling people, the first audacious step to inclusion is to decolonize how we relate with each other. We deal with racism, colonialism. I think, and it was already mentioned earlier by Bishop Karen, intersectionality is very important. And regionalization is about how we relate with each other as a church. Um, and we need to we need to make this happen. But the fact that Central Conference leaders came up with a bold, big plan that is now, I'm so happy after being a ragtag team, a small group of people in the Christmas Covenant team way back in 2019, 
Now the standing committee, the connectional table, our bishops embrace this piece of legislation, which is worldwide regionalization, submitted by standing committees, which Randall said is one of the three R's. Last year and early this year, the United Methodist Africa Forum was formed by United Methodist Africans for the UMC in the African continent. And they support regionalization and they're against any more disaffiliation. That to me has been a dream as an organizer, because I was I was thinking, I our first, you know, when I was convening the Christmas Covenant team, one of our organizing principles were local people organize local people. Nobody's gonna parachute in into my central conference from another place telling us what to do. And I was so happy when United Methodist Africa Forum you know, was formed, uh, UMAF, they're United Methodists, like in Africa doing this work. And this morning, I was in a meeting with delegates and leaders representing all central conferences to talk about our delegations, how many are coming, who don't have visas, who have visas, who supports regionalization. This level of organizing, communication and cooperation between central conference delegates has not happened before, I've, I, I, in my knowledge, especially in my own central conference. We've never really coordinated this way before. And now we are coordinating with the support of our bishops. And when, after that meeting, the two-hour meeting from 7 a.m., my time, the numbers are very hopeful. I'm not going to give the numbers out so that I'll keep uh, GMC and WCA guessing on our numbers. But I can tell you uh, the Filipino delegates uh, anonymous poll. We did an anonymous poll. We have 52 delegate slots. 51 are coming with visas and one uh, seat uh, because that delegate didn't get a visa and too late to apply for a visa. So we have 51. We had did an anonymous poll and 47 responded to this poll. Okay, 47 of 51. I was pleasantly surprised with the numbers. 85% support worldwide regionalization, with 15% not sure. So there's room to convince. There were no no votes. 65% support passage of the revised social principles. 18% are not sure. That means we can still talk to them. And surprisingly, given the fact that the Philippines is very conservative, 55% support the removal of discriminatory language in the Book of Discipline, with 6% not sure. And then 83% reject extending disaffiliation in central conferences and across the connection, 10% not sure. So this, this is really a good number to work with, and I see this as, as resurrection power, when we have relationships and when we trust each other. And on a personal note, I've been working with RMN now for close to 11 years. I started in 2013 as a halftime organizer, and I came out to my bishops in 2015. And I've maintained my membership in my annual conference in the Philippines. And guess what? My bishops keep appointing me to RMN since 2013. I've been working with RMN and my bishop in the Philippines appointed me to this work as an out gay clergy person. And I have... I have friends, some of them are, you know, closeted, gay, uh, LGBTQ youth. Some of them are, you know, in the closet. Some of them are not. And they keep saying, please don't move your membership because we're so happy whenever the bishop reads your appointment to be with Reconciling Ministries Network. It gives a lot of us hope. And that hope is contagious. I think that hope is is resurrection power. Um, and speaking of RM, RMN, you know, we... We, I mean, I, that's my day job. I work with RMN as an organizer for the Western jurisdiction, the North Central jurisdiction. We stand on the shoulders of those who have resisted, persisted, and struggled on, as uh, Randall mentioned earlier, of our LGBTQ ancestors and allies. And we have done so much work in the last five years. There are new reconciling churches in Africa, two in Kenya. And there's one coming soon in another country that we will announce um, right after general conference. That is, again, a glimpse of resurrection. We have a reconciling community in the Philippines that is actively organizing and supporting our Filipino delegation. Very, very quiet support. But a lot of these organizers that I work with are reconciling United Methodists. Since 2019, 
we added 10,312 new reconciling United Methodists, which is a quarter of a total, a quarter of our total number of reconciling United Methodists, which means we have doubled the average per year this past five years compared to the 36,260 reconciling United Methodists who signed up from 1984 to 2019. That's 35 years. You've doubled the average to 2,000 per year. We currently have 1,441 reconciling churches, communities, and campus ministries. In five years since 2019, we have nearly doubled the total number of reconciling churches and communities. That's 611 reconciling churches and communities in five years compared to 830 reconciling churches and communities from 1984 to 2019. I know we still have a lot of work to do, a lot of intersectional justice to live into, but I celebrate that this last five years, God's resurrection power is, is working because of the relationships we have built, the trust we are building, and of course, this year's RMN's uh, 40th anniversary. So we will celebrate at Gel Conference. Again, we know how this story ends. We do, with resurrection a new church that welcomes and affirms all people. And I remember the first words of the resurrected Christ. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. There are people fear-mongering amongst us. But the resurrected Christ says, do not be afraid. Amen. Well, good evening. I hope that uh, you are able to take uh, bio breaks um, because this is a long evening and there's a lot of information that's being shared with you and beautiful, beautiful, inspirational uh, words that we need to hear um, in this moment of the church. So, buenas noches. Uh, my name is Lydia Munoz and I uh, serve as the executive director of the National Plan for Hispanic and Latino Ministry. And I am so grateful to be a part of this conversation of uh, thinking and reimagining re the church in its resurrection power. So I give thanks to all of you. Um, I'm just going to share really quick um, my screen. And there we go. Um, as I said before, I am I am the executive director of one of six uh, ethnic plans of the United Methodist Church, and uh, we have been together since 1992. Um, that was the formation of the Hispanic Latino Ministry in the 1992 General Conference, um, and so uh, we're we're grateful for that. The um, the vision of the Hispanic Latino ministry is to accompany, to provide acompañamiento. It's a word that we use in Spanish and it actually comes from music. Um, it is the accompaniment underneath the melody. So what we like to, uh, uh, to think of is, or imagine is the annual conferences uh, creating a melody for Hispanic Latino ministry within their context. And we provide the accompaniment. We wanna walk with you and uh, strategize with you to build beloved community. We also do this because the general conference of which we're talking about so much, um, uh, it's, uh, it's part of our tradition since 1992. Um, it is a general conference mandate. Um, both the Hispanic La um, plan for Hispanic Latino ministry and the work of developing strategies with annual conferences. I bet you didn't know that part of that mandate is that every annual conference is to have a committee on Hispanic Latino ministry that helps the annual conference strategize this. Um, and so a lot of people don't know this, that we have this intentional language in our general conference, in our um, ADCA, and it appears there again for our approval. And the way the work 
uh, that we do works. We work in collaboration with our general agencies. And so this work, and I'm going to come back to the general agencies when I talk about budget a little bit, because um, a lot of times people um, don't understand the impact of our general agencies, but uh, there is much to be said about the partnering and work that the general agencies do. The other uh, hat that I wear is as a, um, a delegate or a representative of Marcha. Um, I am a member of Marcha. I've been a member of Marcha since way before 1992. I won't give away my age. Um, but uh, um, And Marcha stands for Metodistas, Methodist, Asociados, Associated, Representando, Representing, La Causa, The Cause, Hispano Americano, Hispanic American. And now we say Hispanic Latino because we include our Brazilian and Haitian uh, siblings um, in, in the caucus. And this is a, a caucus of the United Methodist Church that has global reach. And uh, the work of Marcha is to be an instrument of advocacy for Hispanic Latino Methodist. Um, and that ensures that the contributions and the cultural values of Hispanic Latino people are received and appreciated in the church and society. So that's part of the work. So at this moment, everyone is pivoting. Everyone is doing the work of what do we do? How do we respond in this moment after disaffiliation? Um, my colleagues talked about um, budgets and um, what the disaffiliations has done to a lot of our structure. And this is a time for pivoting and it's not a bad thing uh, necessarily. It could be painful, it could be hard work, it could be a little bit of struggle, but um, it, is, it is the work of uh, the Holy Spirit. I believe. So since 2018, the national plan has been uh, engaging in a discernment process to, um, to see how God is calling us to pivot. And one of the things that um, it, God is calling us to pivot is in the, in the direction of being more intentional about our work um, of anti-racism. A lot of our work and um, is about accompanying annual conferences as they have the hard conversations around racism, around inclusion, around uh, uh, the willingness and the openness of what God's vision for the whole church is, what God's kingdom is about. And a lot of those conversations require some deep pivoting, some deep uh, Holy Spirit talk. And so we have uh, discerned that because our work is centered around anti-racism and inclusion and uh, cultural competency and strategic direction, we have decided to move from the General Board of Global Ministries, where we have been a part of for over 30 years, and to move to the General Commission on Religion and Race so that our work is even more supported. This doesn't mean that we stop our connection with any of the agencies, with uh, we all the work, the programmatic work of the plan, just like our other ethnic uh, plans, work through the general agencies. And which brings me to the next uh, point. Now, this is something uh, um, our, our, um, my brother Randall talked about the three R's and so did Izzy. And I, um, this one of the things that uh, both Marcha and the national plan is uh, really uh, supporting the three R's. The other R that we haven't talked about and I think should be included in the R's is realignment. So this is a press release that our GCFNA, our, our General Commission on, uh, uh, on Finance and Administration, Committee on Finance and, and Administration, talked about the reduction of, of, of the budget. I'm not going to read it. You have it there. It's quite significant, as, as Brother Randall said. It's pretty uh, um, uh, strong. But I want you to see specifically the areas where the budget will be felt the most. And so 
this is where I really want to pause and us, for us to think. The reduction of the Black College Fund by 47%, Africa University by 47%, Central Conference Theological Fund by 50%. What is the impact of budget cut in, to our general agencies? Remember the works of the plans, um, uh, our ethnic plans are worked out through our general agencies. 53% reduction. Now, I am grateful that our agencies, the majority of our agencies have taken on the 53% because, and, and have advocated and um, moved that the General Commission on the Status and the Role of Women and the General Commission on Religion and Race and all the ethnic plans only be reduced by 1%. But that means that our other agencies, which we're where we carry out a lot of our work, are really being impacted. So one of the things that I ask myself, or that as a pastor, as 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 pastoring for over 20 years, um, is always telling my congregation that the budget is a moral document. It is the way we understand where our vision and mission is. And so when we talk about full inclusion, right, we want to make sure that we are doing it in a way, and I think Izzy talked about this, where we decenter the systems that normally operate and cause us to make these decisions that, mm, for lack of a better word or better phrase, sometimes the budget is based on the backs of those who really are doing the work of partly full uh, of the full inclusion. Um, and, you know, when we talk about uh, decentering um, our budget and decentering our the way our structure of a church, and we talk about regionalization, that's part of decentering. We talk about revision of the social principles, which is part of decentering. We see it in the document, we hear it in the document, and we know that removal of the of, of, of the harmful language is part of that decentering as well. Realignment of our budget or the budget that matches our vision and mission is important as well. And so for me, one of the ways that I, um, would hope that we see resurrection. I'm gonna stop sharing right now. One of the ways that I hope that we will see um, resurrection is in a way where we do not allow the systems that we often operate that normalize a very US-centered approach to organizing community. Um, where certain uh, parts of the institution are more valued than others. One, uh, an example or metaphor that I often like to use is often to describe myself as an American, I often have to say, I'm a Hispanic or Latino American. There's always a qualifier, African American, uh, Filipino American, uh, you know, all these qualifiers before I can actually say I'm an American or I'm, an, I'm a US uh, uh, citizen. And I'm hoping that a resurrection church does not do the same to all, all our ethnic ministries that we don't have to say all the time, ethnic ministries is what we do on the side ethnic ministry is what we do in mission. Ethnic ministry is, you know, something that we have earmarked as a side um, part of our budget, but that actually we decenter and recenter where Jesus is calling us. I think Bishop Karen said it, where does it hurt and what does God say? Um, and so, um, my presentation is not too long, so I'm going to leave you with that, and maybe that gives more room for other people to, to speak. Thank you so much. Gracias. All right. Thank you very much. I want to start by um, thanking uh, Don and Harvey for putting this program on, and it's an honor to be a part of this esteemed um, panel. 
um, with all the wisdom that has been shared already. I know we're bumping up against the time. I will um, do my best to be concise. We may, um, I've been told from the organizers that we can go over uh, five, a few minutes. So I'm gonna um, try to be as concise as I can, but I'll also um, be thoughtful. I know it's getting late. Um, so I do wanna say I'm with Mainstream UMC and you can find us at mainstreamumc.com. Um, there are several other programs of uh, videos that we've done that are good resources for your local church that you can find on our resource page. As soon as this video is available, I'm going to add it to your the resource page um, so that other people can see it as well. Um, and we are also on Facebook at the Mainstream UMC, and we're going to be using that during general conference for regular updates during general conference about what's happening because I refuse to use Twitter. I think Twitter has died and is in need of resurrection itself. Um, but we're going to talk about the resurrection of the church tonight. Um, I'm very excited about the um, about what's already been said. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a bunch of numbers and probably more um, than you'll be able to absorb. But like I said, this video will be online. There are other videos online as well um, that have this information. But I want to just say I'm a third generation United Methodist pastor, notably in this conversation from um, three different denominational structures. My great-grandfather was an ME South pastor. My father was in the Methodist Church, Methodist Episcopal Church, and I was born into the United Methodist Church and have been a clergy and served churches for 25 years. Since 2018, I've been the executive director, co-founder and executive director of Mainstream. And our goal originally um, was to pass the One Church Plan, which did not pass. Um, that's old news, and we are moving on from that, but um, our work continues. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about a little bit how we got into this position. You've heard about the 1972 language that was introduced, um, the anti-gay language that was put in that said homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching, then the marriage restrictions, then the ordination restrictions, then the funding ban, um, this repeated ramping up. Meanwhile, while the United Methodist Church has been ramping up our anti-gay language and our discipline, other denominations in our country have been removing it. And if you all have friends who are Lutheran or Presbyterian, I confess that I do. Um, if you have friends who are Lutheran or Presbyterian, UCC, Episcopalian, you know they've removed the harmful language um, 12 to 16 years ago. And so people often ask me, what's wrong with the United Methodist Church? Well, the answer is nothing. The, the, the reason that we are where we are is because of our unique structure. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Prior to the 1980s, only 8% of the delegates, and there are 1,000 delegates to general conference, up to 1,000. Right now, the number is 862, um, but there's up to 1,000 delegates. And prior to 1980, the mid-80s, um, only 8% of the delegates were from outside the United States. That number has grown increasingly to 2012, when it was a third of the votes were, at, were outside the United States. And in 2012, there was a recognition our church is not structured to, to handle international churches. We are a colonial structured church. The way that our discipline is written is the U.S. is the hub and everybody else is a, um, is a satellite. I'm, not, I'm confident that's not how Jesus envisioned the church. And the re move to regionalization is a, is a move to do away with that colonial structure. But in 2012, we recognized that that was a problem, that the U.S. was basically imposing our will because we had two thirds of the vote on the minority vote from outside. And so a decision was made in 2012 to adopt paragraph 101. Paragraph 101 puts much of the book of discipline into um, regional structure where churches outside the United States can make changes. That is not reciprocated to the US church because of our structure. Well, you fast forward to today and 45% of the votes at general conference are from outside of the United States. That's actually a little disproportionate because the growth um, outside of the church has been so rapid that the general conference has actually stepped in uh, the representation primarily from Africa. If that stepping in had not happened, it is likely that the U.S. church would have been um, had the minority votes as many as 10 or 12 years ago. Um, in four years, that stepping in will be over and the U.S. church will be about 45 percent of the votes. Um, the other reason that we have as many votes as we have right now is though 25% of the churches in the U.S. have disaffiliated in the last two years, the General Conference did not refigure the U.S. vote count. So as cons mostly conservative delegates left or disaffiliated, um, most of them, by the way, I would say about 80% of the 
traditional delegates who are committed to the uh, Global Methodist Church have left as an act of integrity. There are probably about 20 or 25 votes left of folks who are committed to the GMC who are coming to wreak havoc at our church. Um, it's completely inappropriate, but they are coming and there's no provision in the discipline to remove them. Um, there are a number of traditionalists who are compatible, who want to be a part of the United Methodist Church. There's nothing wrong with being traditional in the United Methodist Church. There's a role for people who are traditional in the United Methodist Church, um, but there are those who, but they're also committed to the United Methodist Church. So how did we get in this predicament? Um, prior to the 1980s, as I said, there were about 8% of the delegates. Well, there was a decision made in the mid 80s that um, we would start absorbing churches from outside. Prior to the 80s, when a church of a certain became of a certain size around the country, um, there was a movement towards autonomy, an organic movement towards autonomy that was blessed by the General Conference, and the churches became independent. And so all of the Methodists in Mexico, Central America, and South America are all autonomous United Methodists because they came of age before the 1980s. Similarly, all the Methodists in India, China, Korea, Australia, all independent Methodists. In fact, according to the World Council of Churches, there are 10 million Methodists in Africa, 5 million are autonomous, and 5 million are part of the United Methodist Church. What, what was the change? The change was not actually a policy vote at General Conference. It was just a change in practice. Um, and there are really three reasons. And one reason is a good reason, and the other two require increasing levels of cynicism. So you can decide um, this evening how cynical you're feeling. But the first good reason is because the... Um, the United Methodist Church in the United States is overwhelmingly white middle class. And a, a global church makes us a better church, a richer church. Um, the global diversity matters. And that's one of the reasons we're really pushing for regionalization, because we want to hold this global church together in a governance structure that makes sense for everyone. Um, but And that's a good reason. But the other two reasons, starting in the mid-60s, and I like to say this when my dad's listening or is in the room, um, the, in, starting in 1965, the United Methodist Church, like all mainline churches in the U.S., started to decline. That's the exact year my dad came out of seminary. Now, you, you can't say it's entirely his fault, but the correlation is undeniable. But starting in the 60s, this decline began, and folks realized that if we absorbed churches from outside the United States, we would no longer be a declining or, uh, institution. We would be growing again. That's kind of cynical, isn't it? But the most cynical reason is there were people at General Conference who realized by absorbing churches from outside the U.S., these were reliably conservative votes that could keep the U.S. church more conservative than it would have been organically. If this were a U.S.-only vote, we would have removed the harmful language um, 12 to 16 years ago like the other denominations in this country did. So we are where we are now, and we have every reason to believe that we can pass the three R's. Um, at Mainstream, we um, condense two of the R's into one and have a third priority, but we, we all share the same goals. We want to remove the harmful language. We break that into two parts. The revised social principles, that's where the incompatibility language lies and needs to be changed. The new revised social principles will remove that. We need to adopt those revised social principles. The second part is repealing all of the traditional plan and all the previous anti-gay language that's in the Book of Discipline. All of that needs to be repealed. That's removing the language. Someone asked in the chat if there were if there's going to be affirmative language. The commitment the coalition has made at this point is just going back to neutral. Um, many of us would like to see affirmative language put in, but in respect to getting to regionalization, we have agreed to simply remove the language. Um, and then we can work as a US region moving forward if we want when we want to do more affirming things. The second priority, of course, is passing regionalization. Regionalization is challenging for a number of reasons that I'll go into in a second. And our additional priority is ending disaffiliations. The disaffiliation season is over. Um, we, do, we do believe people should be able to leave, so we're not against departures. Disaffiliation is forever associated with paragraph 2553, which was written by traditionalists for progressives to leave, and they ended up using it themselves. They wrote it and they adopted it in 2019 and they ended up using it. And it was passed down from the top down. We don't think the general conference should force annual conferences to do disaffiliations again. That should be left up to the annual conferences or at least up to the jurisdictions or to the central conferences. So we don't, we're not against departures. We don't wanna hold anybody hostage, but we just don't want to force the division again in the US church. Um, and our 
brothers and sisters, our, our siblings in Africa, Europe, and the Philippines have asked for us not to support further disaffiliations for them. So those are our priorities. We are very likely, and I'll give you some vote count, we're very likely to pass the removal of the language because it only requires a majority vote of 50% plus one. If you think back to 2019, the one church plan that we supported um, failed by 50 votes and the traditional plan was passed by 50 votes. We needed 26 people to change their mind. Well, after the traditional plan uh, passed in 2019, there was a huge backlash in the United States against this increasing anti-gay language um, and the ramping up of the penalties for, for queer folks and for their allies. So that um, in the annual conferences in the US in 2019, following that general conference, new elections were taking place for delegates and a huge group of the most traditional delegates lost their seats and they were placed with centrists and progressives. We picked up more than 26 votes in that election season of the church. We then, with disaffiliations, as I mentioned, um, we were not we were not recounted, even though we lost 25 percent of our of our churches. We still have the same number of delegates, and most of the conservative delegates who disaffiliated left, and those were backfilled with centrists and progressives. Again, we're confident that we have the votes now to remove the harmful language, and we will. We also, in order to end disaffiliations, that only requires a majority vote as well. The much more challenging piece is regionalization. Regionalization requires a two-thirds vote at general conference and more difficult, a two-thirds vote for ratification in all the annual conferences um, together. That's the vote that's going to be the most difficult. How difficult is ratification? In 2016, we passed a really radical constitutional amendment that said, and I hope you're sitting down, that women are equal to men in the eyes of God. That did get a two-thirds majority at general conference, and it failed to be ratified. Um, this is the difficulty of getting to two-thirds vote. The challenge of ratification for regionalization is it requires eight constitutional amendments. Those eight constitutional amendments um, need, to, need to be ratified, and we're not confident that we have those votes, in part because while the U.S. has 55% of the votes at this general conference, because of the disproportionate representation that we have, we're already only 45% of the annual conference votes. So that's going to be much more difficult to pass. And so there's a lot of discussion about what happens if it does. If it, do, if it doesn't pass, what do we do next? There is a group working on different plan Bs. Here's what I know. The U.S. church is not going backwards. We're never going to keep persecuting gay people. We're not going to do the trials anymore. We're done. All of that is over and we're not going back. And the U.S. church has a strong sense of wanting to stay together. Um, we've already lost 25% of our people. The way I say it is we had 25% of the people leave because we threatened to remove the language. I certainly don't want to disappoint them and make them think they left for no reason. We absolutely have to change the language, um, and we have the votes to do it. But getting to, we need to have a plan B in case regionalization doesn't um, pass. Someone asked in the chat, what is the elephant in the room? I believe the elephant in the room is the budget because 99.4% of the budget comes from the U.S. church. And I don't know how many Americans you know, but I don't know anyone who's liberal enough or conservative enough who's going to turn over their checkbook without being able to say not only how we spend the money, but how we reach our mission field. And so the U.S. church needs to have the same autonomy that the, re the other regions of the church have. And once we can make our own decisions about our mission field, we want to continue to support our global mission. Breaking up the church and not doing regionalization is the greatest chance of breaking up our global mission, and none of us want that. So that's um, I could I could um, speak some more. Those are some basic numbers um, that you can you can think about. We are working on what happens if it doesn't pass. Um, the coalition that Randall um, referenced has been very uh, has had multiple discussions about that. We are optimistic, um, and there will be resurrection. Um, we, we will change the language, and we are, the U.S. church has a wide consensus. So I'll just close with this. Whether it's secular government or church government, if your goal is consensus, if you fall short of consensus, you reach a majority. Our goal has to be consensus, because if your goal, on the other hand, whether it's secular or religious, is simply a simple majority of, 
of 50% plus one. If you fall short of a majority, you end up in a log jam. And that's where we are as a nation in the United States, and that's where we are um, in the church. We're in a log jam, and we need to find the consensus to move forward. In the U.S., we found a consensus. We support regionalization, and we overwhelmingly support removing the language. We, if there is a consensus globally to stay together, then we will have an opportunity to stay together with our, our global mission. That's our thought, that's our prayer, that's our hope, and that's what we've been working for. And that's what we're gonna to continue to work for as General Conference starts. So I wanna thank you again for the opportunity to be on this. Um, if you want, like I said, if you want more videos, mainstreamumc.com. And we also have a newsletter you can sign up for and follow us on Facebook because we're gonna be doing live updates. And I will promise you this, our updates are very entertaining. So you don't wanna miss them. And um, I thank you for being a part of this seminar and thank you to Umark for supporting it again. Thank you everyone for this uh, informative, inspiring, uh, intellectual conversation. Uh, I don't know about you, but I kept thinking I needed to take a break, but I couldn't miss a single word. So I've been glued to my seat uh, listening. Didn't even get a chance to go up and talk to my wife because we didn't want to miss a word. Thank you to the fabulous uh, panelists who have shared so thoroughly and openly tonight. We've touched the idealistic high points, the, the dreams, the goals of resurrection. We face the practical problems that we face as a denomination two weeks from now. We're gonna need everyone in prayer. We're gonna need your prayer. We're gonna need support for these leaders that are coming before us and from around the world that together we will find uh, God's will for our church and we will experience the resurrection. We're grateful for all of you who have stuck with us this evening. The video has been recorded and in a few days we'll be on Umark's website as well as others around the country. We want thousands to really uh, learn and be prepared for this general conference. We welcome those outside the United States who are listening and participating. We wish we could have had your voice uh, more actively involved tonight. So God bless all of you as we move in this resurrection season to a more inclusive church in Christ's name. Thank you. <laughs>